there had been some history here of basketball, you know. The school fell on some tough times like a lot of the schools in this area did with you know, some of the economy. I just know that the school was going to close because of it. We were, we were in the last year of the school. It was a smaller program at the time, seven kids on the team maybe, three or four of them who they had to convince to come out <laughs> just to have the team. But there's a passion of people here that always wanted something more. Oh, it's for you? They were trying to transition this into what we were going to build. When I was younger, I've always seen players like on ESPN and on Sports Center. I moved uh, to the United States uh, this August. What I like about uh, Americans the most is like they always keep pushing, you know, and it's just a different mentality. You know, to go, go, go big or don't go at all, right? Quickly, it's grown from that to uh, the best conference in the country. Twenty twenty two marks the fiftieth anniversary of Title IX. What challenges do high school girls and their parents still face in fighting for equity? Our reporting has shown that many schools are out of compliance with Title IX and they aren't being held accountable in all cases for this inequity. My first day of softball practice, we had to practice at the tennis courts. Title IX guarantees equitable experiences across all categories, including participation and treatment and benefits, which includes facilities, equipment, and publicity. But disparities remain. We are asking you to stand with us so that future girls don't have to grow up thinking equality has to be earned. They grow up believing that equality is expected. Since Title IX was passed in 1972, many doors have opened for girls in high school sports. But our reporting shows there is still a long way to go. It was very difficult times because it affected all of us. <laughs> For us who have children, we, I lost my job, some of us lost our jobs. I lost the job because I, didn't, I couldn't find anybody to help me watch my children like I, they used to before. But seeing that there's still a community in need, understanding that people still require resources to walk back into the community. Today we served over 200 cars. She needs another one. Can we get one more? Yes, we got you, all right? Used to be a dope dealer. So as I told you, I just did a 180 and switched everything around. And after dope, it's gotta be hope because I put poison in the communities, destruction, violence, drugs. Now I'm putting light, okay, food. Okay, now you talking, baby. Now we talking, baby. Let's work. I look in the mirror and I see an anxious bullseye anticipating the day someone hits me right in the center. My body should be a safe space, a home, a sanctuary for all the complexities that I am. Instead, my body reminds me that to the world today, the only explanation of myself I get to give is the physical reflection of my ethnic identity. As one of the oldest immigration communities, the AAPI people had to survive a brutal history in the past 150 years. Please remember that this is your country and you have every right, as any other Americans, to demand social justice. When we talk about economics, when we talk about politics, when we talk about social situation, we're talking about a design within society. And the artist is always at the core of 
design in society. That's what the artist is about, giving a new vision, giving us that which we would not have without his or her presence. And so, to a great extent, art remains essential in the sense of whatever this vision is, it is the artist who gives it in writing, or gives it in sound, or gives it in the motive aspects of dance, or through color and form, or through the aspiring words of the poet. And in order for us to have a better life, we must eventually go back to lifestyling. And the artist dedicates his life to enhancing the quality of life in his community. And that's what art is about in general. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. All right, I have some questions for you. Okay. Did you know that 80% of all the world's cranes descend on the Platte River? I actually did know that, yes. I didn't even know there were 80 cranes. I meant, um, <laughs> are you comfortable sleeping in a van? Yes. Are you willing to produce the music for this film? 